Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about Bitcoin, and we're going to be looking at the Fear and Greed Index. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out the Telegram channel, which you can find a link to in the description below. Now, I should say, if you are unfamiliar with the Fear and Greed Index, you can see what it is here. Uh, this is where we are getting this indicator from. And, and a lot of people are, are fairly familiar with this indicator. And, and essentially what it does is it, it goes more or less between zero and 100. When it's close to zero, it means there's a lot of fear in the market. When it's near 100, it means there's a lot of greed in the market. And it, and it goes back and forth from extreme greed to extreme fear, from fear to greed, and over and over again. They actually have something like this for traditional markets as well, which I'm assuming this is, is based off of but it, it, it's specifically geared toward the cryptocurrency asset class. So what we have here is, is the fear and greed index, and this is color-coded, okay? So this is the price of Bitcoin color-coded by the fear and greed index. And what's interesting is some of the times it can be misleading if you assume that extreme fear or extreme greed has to turn around immediately. These things can last for more than a day at a time, right? Like if, if you have extreme fear on one day, it doesn't mean that the next day the price of Bitcoin has to shoot up. In the same way, if you have extreme greed in one day, it doesn't mean that the next day the price of Bitcoin has to shoot down. If you go look at this indicator, you can see that in fact in November of 2020, before we had even put in a new all-time high, the fear and greed index was already above 90, okay? so. It should not necessarily be used, in my opinion, as, as the only indicator to identify what's going on in the market. One of the reasons is because crypto investors like myself, right, we're a fickle bunch and we get excited really easily. We get fearful really easily. And so things can move very quickly from, from one end of the spectrum to the other. So one of the things we can do is we can, first of all, switch this to the raw values. We have the price of, of Bitcoin in the background. but one of the things you'll notice, and, and I think one of the ways we can, we can make this a little bit more useful, is if you just look at the raw data, it's hard to know what's really going on because it can, it can go from, say, fear at 39 to extreme greed very quickly. And then it can stay in extreme greed for a long time. So then it, it, it brings, to, you know, brings to the idea to, to, to one's mind, why don't we just use a moving average? Because on any given day, it can move so much, but to sustain higher levels would mean that a moving average would, would actually start to go to those higher levels. To sustain lower levels, the, the opposite is also true, right? You would, you would have to see it stay at those levels for a long time. So what if we overlay, or what if we actually turn this into a moving average rather than the exact raw data at the time? Well, if you do that, you start to see better trends that maybe are a bit more interesting, okay? So if you look at, say, like a seven-day moving average, it smooths out some of the noise, OK, for instance, if you look at it like this, by the time we were, let's say, November 12th, the, the average seven day was at 88 or November 16th, the average seven day was at 88. OK, so it was slightly lagging behind what the raw data was doing. But again, moving averages are, by definition, lagging indicators. But why don't we take it up to longer term moving averages? Here's 14 days. Here's a 30 day moving average. This is basically a one month moving average. And what you notice is that it starts to give a little bit more interesting information. One of the things you'll note is that the 30-day moving average for the, the fear and greed index, it basically bottomed in the summer at around 20 or so. Most recently, the 30-day moving average of the fear and greed index hit about just below 21. So a pretty similar area for the fear and greed index to go when you look at the 30 day moving average. But furthermore, what you'll also notice is that, you know, if you go back to raw data, you can see that the 2019 move had a, had a, had a peak fear and greed index at 95, which is basically the same thing we reached over here, despite the fact that the price went a lot higher, right? A lot higher. Well, and, and by the way, the, the ROI was higher too. What happens though if you look at the 30 day, right? This one came nowhere close to this one. So this move was not as nearly as sustained or as, as long lasting as the one we saw more recently. But where it becomes really interesting in my opinion is where you go to the even longer moving averages and this starts to shift over. Look what happens if you go to the 90 day. 
if you go to the 90 day moving average of the fear and greed index, what you see is you see it plateau at around 86, 87. And when it started finally moving down, it didn't mean that the price was not going to be putting in a new all-time high because price did put in a new all-time high, right? It actually put in two new all-time highs. It went to 61K and then, and then a little bit later it went to 64. But this could have been, in hindsight, of course, right? I mean, there were plenty of other indicators that were, that were signaling that this was a local top. Obviously, we've talked about that on the channel. But this 90-day moving average, once it started going down like this, it was perhaps a sign of, of things to come, right? Market was actually starting to get a little bit fearful over, over this price action. Whereas, you know, you kind of see it over here. People took it in stride. Once we had this move to 58K, it came down. Despite the fact that the price was moving up, fear and greed index started moving down. Now, arguably, you could just say, well, it was moving down because people aren't going to be super greedy or the, the, the mentality isn't going to be super greedy if, if the price is staying the same for, for three months, right? So it kind of makes sense that it was going down. But one of the interesting things, we're just trying to figure out ways that maybe this can be helpful in the future. When you look at this and in the future, if the fear and greed index is, is the 90-day moving average of it, is just plateauing at 80 to 90 or something, it's probably a decent sign that the, the local top is close to being in, right? It doesn't mean that it has to be in right then, but it means that it's close to being in at some point, it, probably within you know the, the foreseeable future, right? Rather than saying it has to happen tomorrow, it could happen a week later, it could happen a few weeks later. But even if it, even if it happens a few weeks later, it doesn't mean that, that, that whatever the top is is going to be a lot higher than what we saw because, again, the 90-day moving average of the Fear and Greed Index hit 87 back in, in February at 58K. And then it started to go down. And what you'll also notice is that it sort of hit a bottom on the 90-day around the same place that it hit a bottom following the March 2020 capitulation, which also more or less corresponded to where the 90-day moving average was back during the, the 2018 bear market that lasted for, for over a year. So I was thinking, looking at the 90-day SMA of, of the fear and greed index could be somewhat useful. What's also interesting in, in terms of comparing, say, the 69K move to the 14K move, they're actually somewhat similar in, in that they were not long-lasting. Um, and, and relative to what we saw over here, they were somewhat pathetic, okay? Another thing to consider is if the 90-day SMA of the fear and greed index typically turns around, let's call it between, um, if we look at it, say like right here, it was around 24, 25. If you look at it back in March 2020, it was like 26. In the summer of 2021, it was 27 or so. So if it turns around, let's say between 25 to 30, it's interesting to note that right now it's at it's it's actually at 30. Okay, so it, it has dropped significantly recently, well, maybe slightly above 30, uh, but it, it's right around that 30 level, 30.78 or so. Now you might say, well, does that mean that the price has to go down? Well, no, it doesn't. First of all, the fear and greed index again is a fickle thing, and prices could go down one day, and then there's extreme fear again, and then we could go back up to a higher price the next day. But the thing that you have to notice is that it is in fact a lagging indicator, okay? So the bottom that we saw back in August of 2021 actually did not hit until a few weeks after the actual bottom hit because, again, it's a lagging indicator, so it takes time to, to say, round out some type of, of a bottom. So right now, it looks like it's still more or less in a downtrend. If we if we zoom in, it's perhaps sort of starting to, to turn back up a little bit, but... It still could be a little bit more downside here in the short term. But of course, that will depend on, on what the price of Bitcoin does. I imagine if Bitcoin, you know, breaks up to 47K in short order, then the market's going to start getting greedy again. And therefore, this will turn up quicker. If on the other hand, you know, the, the market dumps tomorrow, then you're going to get extreme fear again, and more than likely. And, and then it could perhaps continue, continue this trend. But I thought this was an interesting way to look at it, to actually look at a moving average of the fear and greed index rather than just looking at the raw data itself. Because again, looking at the raw data itself, it's pretty noisy and, and it's hard to really know what's going on, um, especially when it, you know, especially when it can go up to really high values. I mean, here it went up to 83, 
when when Bitcoin was at 12K. So it certainly would not have made sense back then to offload all of your Bitcoin because the you know because I went to eight into the 80s because I mean it still didn't stop Bitcoin from from basically going up another 6x just a few months later. So perhaps applying a long-term moving average can give a better idea of, of what's actually going on rather than just trying to look at the raw data. And I, I think one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to add these moving averages was because, you know, when we're in downtrends like the one we were in for the last three months, you basically just see it showing extreme fear every single day. And so it becomes this, uh, like, a, like, you know, at some point it's like, well, I mean, what is it, what is it, how is it, how is it super useful if it's just going to show extreme fear or extreme greed every, every single day? Well, there is utility in it, I think. You just have to, you just have to sort of dig deeper into the data than just looking at, say, a single data point. Okay, so I do think it is useful. It becomes a lot more useful when you, when you sort of smooth this data out rather than just simply looking at the raw values. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up. We also do have the premium list at intothecryptoverse.com. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'll see you next time.